Hi, and welcome back to Higher Hertz. I'm Justin Leppard, your online cello teacher, here today, finally, to work on some repertoire. Repertoire being a term for the music that you already know how to play. So, for example, in the cello repertoire, meaning the pieces that are written for cello that are typically played. This is our first piece of repertoire. Congratulations for making it this far. Maybe you're just scouting it out, but hopefully you've been following along, progressing uh, with your cello, practicing how to have your bow hold, how to have a good posture, how to practice your basic scales and arpeggios, and you're ready to start actually using that to play something that's actually melodic, recognizable, and the first piece that you learn if you follow the Suzuki method of instruction, which is probably the most popular method of instruction in the US um, just generally, um, because what the Suzuki method does is it teaches you a progression of songs that get progressively harder. And it's been sort of vetted by music teachers and uh, it in, in conjunction with what is often called you know traditional cello education which is starting with rudiments starting with scales uh the suzuki method is good because it actually starts uh you on a piece by learning the way we're going to learn it not from the page but from actually just showing you and and playing for you how it's going to sound i mean obviously we all know how twinkle twinkle little star sounds but we're going to learn it today at the cello so What's amazing about Twinkle Twinkle Little Star is how remarkably few notes there are in it. It's in, this, it's in the key of D major, but we don't even have all seven notes of the key of D major in it. We only have six notes. We only have... So if you've already been practicing even just your one octave D major scale, you're actually overprepared for this piece, which is why, or at least one of the many reasons why, it is the piece that's assigned very first in the Suzuki method, which also, if you want to purchase the book, includes rhythmic variations on it. So you're not only learning a simple melody and getting acquainted with the cello, you're also starting to get a sense of different rhythms and different bowings and how all of these things work together. Um, so also keep in mind that what I'm showing you today is absolutely one way of playing it. You can take everything I say and reverse the bowings. You can try doing the same notes in different locations if you dare. Uh, uh, but what we're gonna just talk about is kind of the bare bones. How do you play this melody? So the melody starts um, with the open string. So you play the D string twice and the A string twice. Okay, so already you're gonna see this is the advantage of having already practiced bowings and things like that, because even that might cause you problems. We haven't even put our fingers down and already that could cause you problems if you haven't just practiced, spent time with the cello and been practicing that. If you have, let's continue. And we're gonna play first finger the sixth note of the scale, B, uh, two times as well, and then open the A string again. So the first part of the phrase is Hooray. Um, and then when in music, we call this the uh, antecedent part of the phrase or the antecedent phrase, it has a certain unresolved quality to it. It has an answer. Uh, anti in this case means before, so antecedent like what comes before. And then there's a consequent phrase, which is and it's very similar in, in the sense that it's two notes per bow. Um, we just finished the scale. So again, you're practicing your scales and you're practicing them up and down. Here it is. Here's a scale. And then uh, we'll do starting from the A, but otherwise we're just playing a scale. And then two, boats, two notes per bow. And then this repeats and you can play it a little quieter the second time. And this whole thing that we've played in the middle has been what we would call a B section, something that contrasts with an A section that'll return. Now the A section has returned and we play it again. So the whole thing
All right, so a few things to note about this. First is that because it's two notes per bow, except for the last note of each partial phrase, you're gonna have to start the next section starting up bow or do a retake. So you have a decision to make. If you've been practicing bowing and you know how to go back and forth equally, then you know I think the way that it's mostly taught to children, that second phrase does start on an up bow. But if you want them to all sound similar, you might do retake. notice is that in contrast to playing this against scales or other technical things there's actually like music going on and one of the most common words that gets thrown around in talking about musicality especially in the classical world is phrasing phrasing was sort of an elusive concept for me for a long time i feel like in some ways i didn't understand it although i in theory understood it in theory what phrasing is is the musical equivalent of the different ways that we can speak I can speak like this, I can speak like this. And those are different ways of phrasing the same words. So when we're given the, the sheet music, we're given um, a set of instructions, essentially, that's, that's highly no organized in the way it's notated. You know, we have the notes and we have rhythms that are assigned to them and we have certain dynamic markings. Uh, and yet there's always going to be you know, some amount of information in how you play it that's not explicitly printed on the page. That's gonna be how you, specifically you, end up playing it. This is called the interpretation, interpretation of the music. So when we're actually, this is the reason why I was talking about antecedent and consequence, A section, B section, A section, because understanding that sort of stuff is maybe the technical information that allows you to know what you want to do with it. You know, a, a, a prose or verbal equivalent of Twinkle Twinkle Little Star might be something like, did you go to the store today? Yeah, I came back with bread, but not milk. Are you sure there's not milk? Yeah, there was definitely no milk. Dang, I really wish that I had gotten some milk. Maybe next time I'll get some milk. Can we get some ne milk next time you go? Absolutely, we'll get some milk for you. That's basically Twinkle Twinkle. That's basically the song. A little conversation that you're having comes back to the first place that you mentioned it, but you know, maybe a little bit different. So how would you say that? You know, this is the question you have to ask. And so once you get once you get playing the notes and once you get playing the the notes in a way where they're, you know, mostly in tune and everything, and you know, you're just starting to figure out, oh, you know, what's what's wrong? What's missing? You can just start to experiment and you don't have to be hard on yourself whether it's right or wrong. Be funky with it, you know? You can even play different rhythms. And that might not be the way you perform it, but that's what practicing is for, is you can, you can do all the different crazy things. Play it exactly the way you would normally play it, but up bow, just as a means of discovering what that does for it. Whoa, so for me, that feels more like, did you, the bread, <laughs> it's like you're trying to say it on the in, in uh, the ingressive breathing. Um, I'm not really so sure if I like that, but what's interesting about it is you can think about maybe slurring to get that for some of the notes, like dum ba right? So I was choosing some moments to slur the notes based off of where I wanted the accentuation in the line to be. Another thing that you can try is doing different fingering. So like I was saying, uh, you know, in another video, professional cellists will often not play open strings, even if they're the easy thing to do because the open string sound, you don't have as much control over. You, you just have the, the bow and you're usually starting from a string that's not moving. So if you know inertia, it's hard to get something moving that's not moving. So the, the way to do it might be to put 
Instead of open string, first finger, fourth position, which is the same thing, a string below. trying those different fingerings you might get a couple of things that didn't sound as good uh like i did but maybe that's not a bad thing you, you know you just have to learn what were those tricky moments uh and then when you play it again <laughs> Personally, I find it really hard to play musically, like, all the time. There's going to be some times that you're, like, really feeling it and you really want to play it, and then there's going to be a limit to how much you can do that before you're killing yourself and you don't even feel creative anymore. So that's where a lot of practicing and the difference between practicing and performing is that in practice, you can do different rhythms, try different fingerings, do things where you don't care if it doesn't sound great because you're just trying to see whether it works as a fingering or bowing or whatever, as just a way of saying it. And then when you have those moments where you're like, okay, so let's try playing through it, you can really focus in, and then you're really training yourself to be flexible. You're training yourself to be more musical because you're really focused in when you're doing it. And you're also just training yourself to have a different relationship to your instrument than just one where you're worried about whether it sounds right or wrong. That's the relationship listeners, audience have to the instrument, typically. But the player, there's so much more going on. There's just so much more that you've practiced, so much more that you know about how the cello works, you know, if you spend a lot of time with it. So there's this parallel journey going on. And what might not seem obvious when you see a performer performing is that, you know, they can do the whole piece backwards bowing. What might not seem obvious when you see a performer performing is they could do all that without a good bow hold because they have practiced it so many different ways and practiced their instruments so many different ways that the differences don't need to be independently practiced in the moment. They can actually just be accessed and used. So I will never stop emphasizing the importance of practicing technique enough. That's really going to be how you're going to get this um, to be possible to practice rep in a satisfying way. So just to summarize one more time, the way you play Twinkle Twinkle Little Star is you have six phrases where it's two notes repeated and most of them are scales. And it's D, D, A, A, one, one, A, four, four, three, three, one, one, open. A, A, four, four, three, three, one. A, A, four, four, three, three, one. And everything else is up to you. Really hope you guys enjoyed watching this lesson. You're excited to get into rep. Let us know in the comments what you'd like to learn, and we'll do a lesson video on some popular requests for how to plays. Well, once again, uh, this is Higher Hertz. Please subscribe and hit the bell for more cello lesson videos. Once again, I'm Justin Leopard. You can find videos of me playing on the Vagabond Cellist on YouTube, and we will see you guys in the next lesson. Thanks for watching.